Okay, welcome to week one, January, winter, spring semester for 721 Ministries. We're going to jump off into or immediately into what I call our spiritual inventory. And this is a great exercise to not rate yourself or grade yourself, but chart yourself. Chart yourself on where you are in your relationship with Jesus, where you are in your relationship with your Heavenly Father, and what your spiritual journey looks like. And if you'll follow what I emailed to you and print that out, or if you're watching this and you want to go to our website, we've got a link to this and you can print it out yourself, the spiritual inventory. It's 30 questions that really address where you are spiritually, where you are in your journey. And it's not a, you're doing great or you're doing poorly. It's a way to chart yourself, to assess where you are. There are five questions at the end that really deal more with your family and your marriage. And here's what we're going to do. It, the first week of each month, we're going to tackle six, five or six of these questions and one of the last five questions. So January, February, March, April, May, the first week of each month, we're going to take five or six of these questions. We're not going to be robotic about it or rigid about it. We're going to take what comes our way. Uh, but we're going to cover these. And it, it'll, I think it'll be a very helpful exercise as, as opposed to doing all 30 five at the same time or trying to do those weeks in a row is to come back at the beginning of each month and remind ourselves to have that spiritual inventory check to say, where am I? Because we all drift. Some drift further than others, but we tend to drift. So I think that you'll find this to be a helpful exercise. And let me start by making these observations about what I call bumping the trajectory. Bumping the trajectory, your trajectory. My father observed me, this was years ago, before I had a clue who Jesus was, just in a casual conversation. He said, you know, son, I've, I've noticed that with people and their development in all areas of life, that it's not really so much a steady increase as it is these bumps. And they go from one level to the next level, seemingly overnight. And you've seen this in athletics, maybe in your own life in athletics or some, some uh, talent that you had that you were working at. It could have been piano. It could have been any type of musical thing. It could have been writing. It could have been dancing, tennis, whatever. That as you work at it and as you invest in it and put your heart and soul in it, that yes, you're getting better and better every day. There is an upward trajectory. But suddenly one day you realize I, I've mastered that or man, I'm so much better, or I got that. It's, it's true in college. I remember my first year in college, and I've said this to so many college students, your first year, a lot of your first year is about learning how to study for college. And then one day you go, oh, I, okay, I got this. It was that way in sports for me, and I've watched it in other people's lives. So bumping your trajectory, more so than spiritual highs, which tend not to last, more so than New Year's resolutions, which tend not to last. But I want you to think of this. Think, think of, a, of a graph where the, the chart is upward. And it's upward at, let's just say, 30 degrees. And if that's your spiritual journey, hopefully you are on an upward incline, that you are growing. And yes, you will backslide. And yes, you'll have dips. But in a, generally, you're not sitting still and you're not going backwards. And you're not falling off. You've got a slight incline. But these bumps in the trajectory, let's take that original incline that you're on, and let's just say for the sake of example that that'll get you to 5,000 feet. Well, if you go along a little ways and you bump that trajectory just a little bit and stay on the same incline, but now you've bumped it up a little bit, now you're going to reach 10,000 feet with the same general incline slope. But along the way, you bump that a little bit more. And you're, now you're going to reach 15,000 feet. And along the way, you bump it a little bit more. And now with the same incline, you're going to reach 20,000 and on and on. And that's what our spiritual journey looks like. It's what mine has looked like. So the question is, how do we bump our trajectory? And again, you may think in terms of a spiritual high that, that can, but it tends not to last. No, I think when we think of bumping our trajectory, we think of two things. One, we start doing things differently. And two, we stop doing things that are getting in the way. 
we start doing and we stop doing. Now, as we tease through this thought, I'll, I'll bet you if you're awake and if you're actually allowing your, your soul and your spirit to speak to you or the Holy Spirit to speak through you and into you, you immediately think of one or two things that you could, that you really should stop doing or possibly start doing. Now, it's not about doing so much as it is about being, but you're not going to change and transform your being without doing. So I don't want anyone to jump on a performance treadmill and say, okay, I'm going to do better by gosh, because it really is about transforming your soul. I want to be a different man. I cannot, I cannot get to where I want to get spiritually. I cannot have my heart softened and had the love, joy, peace, patience that the Holy Spirit has for me, the life that Jesus wants for me until I become a different man. The old Sam's not going to do it. The Holy Spirit has to do this, but I have to play my part. So, for instance, I, sometimes I'll be, I'll be in a conversation with someone, a man typically, and he'll tell me about some egregious sin that he's living in, sleeping outside of marriage, cheating on his wife, Sometimes it's porn, sometimes it's addictions. And as we talk and he talks about wanting to go deeper in his relationship, I will say to him after a while, I'll say, no, I'm not judging you. Your record will never stack up as to how bad my record has been in the past. But you cannot expect God to bless you when you are clearly living out that way. You, you, Cannot expect him to bless you. So if you want to go deeper in your relationship, you're going to have to stop that. I don't care whether you stop it or not, but I hope you care. So think in terms of what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing to bump my trajectory? Because I want to go deeper. And, and what we'll do is at the beginning of each month, as I said, we will tackle some of these questions. We've got 30 spiritual inventory questions and five marriage and, and family questions. But each one of these, the real question to ask yourself as you chart. So in, in every question, if you charted yourself at a one, two or three, you're nowhere near where you can be in your relationship with Jesus in the life that is truly life in the life to the full, the abundant life. You're nowhere near it. If you're down by a one, a one, two, three, so the question to ask is, why am I here? Why am I down this low? And the next question is to ask, why not? Why am I not at a higher level? Why am I not deeper? What is getting in the way? And that's why we go back to the stop doing and start doing. There are things that you are doing that are getting in the way from your going deeper into the kingdom. And there are things that you're not doing that would be helpful to start doing that are getting in the way. So when you examine these questions, and these are really penetrating questions, ask yourself, why am I grading myself? Why am I charting myself so low in this? Why? And I'm being honest, so why am I low? And why not am I deeper and with closer to the seven, eight, nine? I've got a statement on your handout from Andy Stanley. It's one of his great observations is where you're going, where you want to be when you get there is where you are going, the track you're on, the life you're living, the investment that you're making in your relationship with Jesus, the investment you're making in your relationship with your wife, your husband, your children, your work, your health it is, is where you're going, where you want to be when you get there. Because so many of us who've lived some years and have gotten there in certain areas of our life now look back and go, I wish I'd asked that question. Because if I'd have been able to project out to what this is going to look like, I would have stopped immediately. And so one of my roles when I sit down with men is to let them talk and then gently point out, do you know where this is going if you stay on this track? And it's usually, typically, often men that are looking to get divorced, looking to leave their family, to get free, whatever. And I'll say, you don't know what's down the track on this. You don't know what's ahead. I do. Let me show you so that you don't make the same mistakes I made. So as you look at this is where I'm going, where I want to be when I get there. What a great question. And the other thing to think about is as you look at these, these really, these questions really bring home what you truly believe. 
Not what you say you believe, but what you truly believe. Because what you truly believe will be reflected in the way you act, the way you live, the choices you make, the decisions you make. This will show you what you really believe. And I'm reminded of Jesus saying in John 8, 30, 31, 32, 33, if you, want to, if you keep my commandments, if you hold to my commandments, if you live my teachings out to, your, to the best you can, that, that's how you become a disciple, a true follower. And when you do that, you're going to know the truth and the truth is going to set you free. The truth will set you free. So as you look at these questions, be truthful so that you can be set free from the fact that you're holding yourself back from going deeper. Nobody else is holding you back. You're holding yourself back. So these are great questions to look at. I hope you'll take some time to look at them. I have a couple of questions I want to start with. Given that each one of these questions, a one is the lowest and a 10 is the highest, a one would be the least depth of your spiritual life and a 10 would be the deepest depth. Where do you think an ordinary normal man or woman like you, like all of us out there working with jobs, children, spouses, parents, where can you live? Where, what is achievable? And to help you with your thoughts on that, clearly a 10 is not achievable in this life. It is, 10 is perfect. So we're, we're not going to get to 10. But is a nine available? Is that achievable? Is that something uh, the ordinary person, not a super Christian, but just ordinary person can, where, where can they live on a seven to 10? And I bounce this question around with, with all the men. And the general answer consensus was seven or eight. And I concur with that. You can live a seven or an eight. You can be a, a seven or eight in any of these questions. It's not just for super Christians. It's not just for Billy Graham or Andy Stanley or Mother Teresa or whoever comes to your mind. You can live this way. It's available to you. And I don't want you to think it's not and be resigned to the fact that you've got to stay a two, three, or four. You can live in the seven or eight. In many cases, you can live in the nine. But let's just be... Let's just be easy on ourselves and show some grace and say seven or eight is certainly livable. So that's my first question. And I want you to understand that you can live in that seven or eight. It's not just for super Christians. But the next observation I, was ma I would make is if you're living in the seven or eight, you will taste that nine and at times really close to a 10. If you're living that seven and eight consistently, you'll taste the nine often and possibly even shades of the 10. But if you're down in the two or three or four, you're not even going to see the seven for a couple of reasons. If you're down in the two, three, or four, you'll never see even a seven because you're not investing. You're too far away to even get close. That'd be one reason. And the second reason, which was pointed out by one of the men today, you probably surrounded yourself by people who are three and fours, two and three and fours. You need seven, eight, and nines in your life to pull you forward. I heard one person say, everybody needs a Paul in their life, and everybody needs a Timothy in their life. We need a Paul, someone who's deeper into the kingdom, who'll pull us, who'll challenge us, motivate us, someone we can follow and emulate and say, I want to keep going like that person. We need a Paul, and then we need a Timothy that we can help bring along. And what so often happens when we help someone else along, then we're pushing ourselves even deeper. So you can live in the seven or eight, and you don't want to live in the two, three, or four. And always ask yourself as we look at these, why am I so low? What is it that's getting in the way? So let's just start with number one. The A plus life is through Jesus plus other things, or, and I worded this very carefully and specifically, First, through Jesus only. The A plus life is through Jesus plus other things, or Jesus, first Jesus only, and then these other things. And let me explain that. 
first off, the A plus life, this is not the prosperity gospel. This, the A plus life will be different for you than it will be for me. It's what Jesus said when he said, I've come to give you life, and I'm talking about life to the full, the life that is truly life. It's your individual, tailored, customized life that Jesus has for you that may include a lot of really nice things. It may not, but it'll be the life that he wants for you that will be full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, fullness, gentleness, and self-control. So I'm not talking prosperity gospel when I say A plus life. I'm talking about the life that he has for you. So the question is, the A plus, do I believe that I can have that life if Jesus is first and foremost in my life and these other things are not? Or do I believe that, I? yes, it is Jesus. I know it's Jesus. I've come to that realization. I've finally understood that I can. It's got, I got to have Jesus in my life. But it's got, it's Jesus plus these other things, things such as comfort. I like my comfort. Things such as enough money or really, truly more than enough money or good health or being thought well of or my business going well or any number of things. You can fill in the blank. You know what they are. Do I believe that I could have the life that Jesus wants for me if I don't have those other things, but I do have Jesus and I do have him in a meaningful, deep, rich way? Do I believe that? And don't fool yourself, because if you don't believe that, then these other things will not ever bring you any love, joy, peace, patience. It has to be Jesus first, and it took me a long time to get there, but I got there by bumping the trajectory, by starting things in my life and stopping things that were in my life to where I now know, and I like comfort, and I like to have extra money, and I like to drive a nice car, and I like all those nice things, and I don't want to lose them, but I finally came to the realization that he's it. He's it. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus first and only. Then these other things, they sort themselves out. It's no different than what Jesus said in Matthew 6 when he said, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek me first. And all these other things will be taken care of. I like to use the example of a cake and icing. If Jesus is the cake in your life and all these other things are just the icing, that's a balanced, full life. But if these other things are the, are the cake and Jesus is the icing, that's no good. And you know it's no good. It, that doesn't work. The things that become icing, boy, they are wonderful when they're second to Jesus. But when they're first and Jesus is just mixed in there, you will not have the A plus life. So if you look at this and you say, you know, if I'm honest with myself, it really is Jesus plus. And so I got to put myself down around a two or a three then start looking to him and saying, I want it to be you. He'll help you. I want it to be you. And all these things, he'll help you get closer to him. Number five, joy in my life. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Number five, joy in my life. Number one, not much. Ten, overflowing. And we define joy, Dallas Willard, a pervasive sense of well-being. A pervasive sense of well-being. Do I have joy in my life? Not, I mean, happiness goes along with joy, but not happiness based on happenings, circumstances. I like happiness. Jesus said, you, I want you to be happy. But joy is that pervasive sense of well-being. Do you have that? Am I, am, am I, if I'm honest, I'm saying, you know, not much. I mean, I have good days and I have bad days, but not much. Or, do, or am I overflowing with joy? Because you can be joyful always. Be full of joy. And why? Well, number one, because I got Jesus, and he's number one. And these other things, they're in second place. So they don't, they don't have the power to disrupt my joy. Question number two, I am living with the power of the Holy Spirit. None, not even sure what that means. Ten, living with the power of the Holy Spirit. Where are you in this? I'm living with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
because this is really where it all starts. And it's such an enigma and it's something that is not taught in the churches. And it's so hard to get your arms around it, to grasp it. But when you surrender your life to Jesus and you are born again, the Holy Spirit indwells you. He gets all of you. Or let me say it. Different. I'm sorry. I said that the wrong way. You get all of him, but he doesn't get all of you. And we're going to tease that out during this month of January, how we, how we have these rooms in, our, in the houses of our souls, of our hearts, that we won't let him in. We'll talk more about that later. But as my living with the power of the Holy Spirit, am I leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit? Am I, am I learning to find and seek this Holy Spirit power, which was assumed in the New Testament, that all believers would live with the power of the Holy Spirit, that all believers would be seven, eight, nine, not just super Christians. So how do I live? How do I learn to live with the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, we have four words that we put together. See, seek, want, wait. See, seek, want, wait. You have to first see that the Holy Spirit's real. You have to first see that he's, and understand that he's real, and he's there. He's tangible in the spiritual world. That's seeing him. Seeking him is to start to look for him. If I lose my car keys and I seek them, I'm looking everywhere for him. I'm always aware that I might see my car keys. To seek the Holy Spirit is to be aware that he, he's there to move at any point. He's involved. And then the two keys, I got to want him to guide me. I got to want to live with his power and not my power. This is not a self power. This is a Holy Spirit power life that we're to lead. It's not a self help. It's a Holy Spirit helping us help ourselves. So I got to want him and then I have to be willing to wait on him. Now I use this example with the men. I take a man who's in the room with me and I'll say, okay, if I want Mills to lead me, and as we leave this room, I want him to lead me, to guide me to a certain location. What do I have to do? Well, I have to follow him. But to follow him, I have to wait for him to get in front of me. And we have to do that for the Holy Spirit to really be able to guide us. And you may only need to wait 30 seconds. Sometimes it's 30 minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks, three months, sometimes seemingly forever. But if I'm willing to wait, to pause, let the Holy Spirit move in front of me. Let him move out into the relationships that I'm struggling with. Let him be a part of my decision-making. Let him give me that guidance, which Jesus promised he would. Again, not just for super Christians. So the challenge is, am I living with the power of the Holy Spirit? And then I put in there 2A, I sense the Holy Spirit nudging me and speaking into me. I use that terminology speaking into me versus speaking to me because I'm trying to avoid this trap that we get into. Of, Am I supposed to hear a voice? You know, what's that God speaking to me? What's that supposed to look like? I never hear an audible voice. Do you hear an audible voice? Well, no, I don't. But I hear an absolute direct statement into me. For example, just yesterday, I taught this lesson in Lauren's. And yesterday afternoon, I was taking a long walk late in the afternoon, and I was contemplating, I got 35 questions here, Lord. That seems like too many to try to tackle, certainly in one session, but is, should I just do four or five weeks on this? Will, will this sort of lose its umph if I do that? So I was, I was just, and I said, Holy Spirit, help me with this. I didn't, I didn't stop and wait on him. I just said, help me with this. I need, I'd like some, I want to do this the right way. I want to do it the most effective way for the men and for me and for, the, and for you, Holy Spirit. Boom, like a, like a email coming into my inbox. Boom, Sam, you have 30. Break it up. Do five or six of, uh, the first week of each month. That's the Holy Spirit. It, I didn't hear a voice, but he spoke directly in with a definitive statement that I could not miss. I sensed the Holy Spirit nudging me and speaking into me. One, ten. And here we come back to the same question. Why, why not? Why not? Why do, are you one of those who I've never heard God speak to me or I don't have any idea or maybe once in my life. Or, it's, it's intended for it to be a regular thing. 
not that you're hearing voices, but that you're being guided, that he's moving and you know it. So what's getting in the way of that? Well, I can tell you that you're not going to hear from him if you're determined to kick the door in and get your way. If you're one of these, if I don't, it won't people. You're not going to hear from him. If you're listening to the radio or music or podcasts or you're surfing your phone all the time, if you're busy, if you're distracted, you're not going to hear from him. If you're not spending time in the scriptures, if you're not slowing down, if you're not asking him, if you're not wanting him, if you're not seeking him, if you're not willing to wait on him, you're not going to hear from him. But I want you to know you can. It's not for super Christians. You can hear and get his guidance. Sometimes we call it green lights, red lights, and yellow lights. Green lights, you just hear, yes, Sam, this is what I want you to do. Yes. Or red lights, no, Sam, stop. I don't want you to do that. Or a yellow light, will you slow down a little bit? I'm doing some things here. It might be okay for you to go in that direction, but slow down a little bit. I'm going to finish up today uh, with two questions that we did last, did yesterday in one of the meetings, 21 and 21A, 21 and 21A on the second page. 21, reading the Bible is unsatisfying, boring, that's down in the one, positive and enriching. That's on the 10 side. Reading the Bible is unsatisfying and boring, quite frankly, if I'm going to be honest, I'm down in the one, two, or three, or positive and enriching. And then 21A, which I'm going to marry with this first one, I see something new each time I read the Bible. I see something new each time, one or 10. I understand how reading the Bible can be unsatisfying and boring but there are probably some things on your end that are causing that to happen because it's not boring and it's not unsatisfying. It actually is very positive and very enriching. And you can see something new just about every time you're reading, but we're back to the same thing. Not if you're distracted and not if you're just trying to plow through one or two or three chapters so you can read the Bible in a year, slow down, ask Jesus to meet you as you read the scriptures. I'm serious. Ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten the things that you're reading and then slow down and look for things. The slower I go, the more I see. If you were to tell me I read a chapter a day, I'd say you're probably reading too much. I might say, and I've done this in the past, I'm going to read a chapter then I'm going to go back and read the first half of the chapter and concentrate on that. And then the next day, I'm going to read the chapter again and read the second half. But whatever it is you decide to do, slow down because the Bible can be enriching. It can be fun to read. And there's something new to see. You'll never exhaust the little gems that you can mine out of it. That the Holy Spirit will pop up to you. So as we go through this exercise for the next several, uh, well, the first week for the next several months, I want you to look through this and, and actually go through all of them and then ask yourself, why am I so low? Why not am I higher or let's say deeper into the kingdom? Then the last thing I'll do is I'll, I'll just take question 31 because this is the lead follower, get out of the way. Uh, I, this is an expression that came out years ago and I, it might've been a, mar a Marine statement or a sporting statement, but lead, follow, or get out of the way. But the problem for a man a husband, a father, is you're in the way. You can't get out of the way. So you're either leading or you're blocking the way for everyone else. So that's why I title this because this is a men's ministry, but it applies to all of us. So 31, my marriage is bad, a partnership, or thriving. It's not intended to be a partnership. It's not intended to be bad. It's intended to thrive. So why am I so low on this? Or why are you so low on this? And let's look at what is it I should stop doing and what is it I should start doing. So my friends, I hope this has been helpful. I hope you will enjoy this. This is something that is very meaningful to me. The men are taking it seriously. Go through these. Don't beat yourself up. This isn't a competition. If you're getting discouraged, that's Satan trying to discourage you. Your heavenly father is looking and watching and saying, oh, come on, let's, let's, get, let's do this together. 
let's go deeper into the kingdom. And I don't know anything that's designed better to wake you up to where you are than this little exercise. Uh, I, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week.